In the last video, we saw Sejin trying out his hands at the new named weapon he got thanks to Theo. Using the short dagger of Keens, he cut some onion plants and got a bonus skill proficiency boost. To thank Theo for that and for his good sales, he treated him as the sales cat. But when he got too arrogant, Sejin decided to tell him that his one hour of being the sales cat was over. Then the cat merchant brought out his ace. That was the collection of spices and seasonings he had gotten from the hunters in exchange for clicking selfies, and Sejin was so overjoyed that he made him the sales cat for one whole day. With the new utensils and seasonings, Sejin prepares a lot of dishes for himself and his friends, and despite that, Theo is only interested in plain roasted fish. The next day, he harvests some cherry tomatoes and hands them over to Theo, who does not want a menial job because he is the sales cat, but he gets shocked when Sejin tells him that he is the chairman and still works in the farms. The cat has an idea, and now he plans to become the chairman by working hard, and then he will get all the privileges he wants. After the cat merchant leaves, Sejin harvests more crops and suddenly gets 50% more XP from a bunch of tomatoes. He learns that their rank had improved from E to D, and all their stats and benefits had almost doubled. He is happy and decides to snack on the higher quality and more tasty tomatoes with his friends. Meanwhile, the tower manager has been obsessing over him, and he thinks that the packaged dried sweet potato is much more beautiful than the dragon statue someone made for him. The manager watches Sejin sleeping peacefully with his rabbit friends, but then suddenly wakes him up because there was a monster at the entrance of the cave. Sejin is startled and wakes up, and as the tower manager tries to shoo away the baby bear, it loses its footing and falls down. The tower farmer catches him, and then he is shocked to find that the creature was a baby giant crimson bear. Sejin is shocked as he holds the baby giant crimson bear in his arms, and he wonders if it was the child of the monster who once attacked the cave on a blue moon night. The giant crimson bear was truly humongous and ferocious, and compared to it, its baby looked really small and cute. Sejin is a bit unsure about what to do with the bear cub, who looks quite innocent, but then the tower manager asks him why he caught it. He replies that how could he not catch the baby from falling because it would be quite dangerous for him otherwise. The manager asks Sejin to quickly send the bear out of the cave and says that his mother must be nearby and looking for him. But he does not plan to send away the baby bear immediately, as he sets him on the ground and says that even if he sends him away right now, he will feel bad because the bear is too small. He thinks that it will be better for them to wait for their mother to come back and take him. And the baby bear is excited to see friends of his size for the first time and runs towards them. The tower manager warns Sejun that the crimson bear is a gluttonous monster and he will eat all the food in the cave. And he thinks that the tower manager was just overreacting and says that it was just a small baby. The baby bear tries to be friends with the black rabbit and feels happy when the latter pats his head. He is playing around with the rabbits when he spots the poison honeybees and their queen, and he tries chasing them too. But the honeybees are furious, and as they stare at the baby bear and chase him, he is afraid and runs straight to Sejin for protection. He clings to his feet, and Sejin comforts the bear and then tells the bees that the new guest was not an enemy. He tells the bear that the bees acted so aggressively because he suddenly attacked them, and he tells him not to cry. Then he asks him if he rushed towards them because he smelled something nice from them, and the baby bear can only cry. Seeing him looking so pitiful, Sejin asks the queen bee a favor, and while she does not want to do it, she does it for Sejin with a sigh. She gives the baby bear honey, and Sejin tells him to try it out. The little bear is happy to taste the honey, and as the glutton rabbit pats his head and other rabbits surround him, Sejin says that he knew the bear would enjoy honey, and he must have come here because of its smell. The baby bear finishes the honey quickly and goes back to the tower farmer, who tries to spoil him some more and asks him if he wants more honey. Meanwhile, the tower manager is furious and then suddenly snaps out at Sejun, generating an emergency quest to send the baby crimson bear out of the cave. The reward was a job-related skill, and the penalty upon rejection would be starving to death. The manager then expresses anger towards the baby bear, who is afraid, and Sejun and the queen bee are also shocked. He shouts at the tower manager, saying that this was unfair, the bear was just a baby, and it could not eat enough to make others starve, and he accuses the manager of being jealous. The manager replies that he is just chasing away monsters that can be dangerous to his tower farmer, and Sejin says that he is too much. He says that the baby bear would not have fallen into the cave if the manager had not startled him, and he replies that it was an honest mistake. But now the only thing that was important was that Sejin send the baby bear outside the cave immediately. Sejin hugs the baby bear and says that, talking of mistakes, his coming inside the tower was a mistake too. The tower manager orders him to return the bear outside for the last time. 
But then, seeing the gloomy faces of the farmer and his rabbit friends, he decides to give up and tells Sejin that he can do whatever he feels like. He is also not pleased and says that how much can the little monster eat that the manager is all jealous of him. He agrees to reach a middle ground, saying that he will send it outside when it is time. He then lifts up the baby bear, asking him to stand up since the scary thing had gone, and finds that it was sleeping peacefully. Sejin finds him quite cute and decides to let him sleep inside the cave today and then send him back tomorrow. He falls asleep next to the baby bear, who wakes up as everyone else is asleep and begins doing something sneaky. The next morning, the black rabbit wakes up first, and as he comes outside his house, he is shocked to see the scene in front of him. He begins shouting, and Sejin wakes from all the noise and then realizes that the baby bear is no longer next to him. He lazily walks to where the rabbits had gathered and were angrily lashing out at the baby bear, and when he realizes what had just happened, he is also shocked. There were half-eaten carrots and sweet potatoes lying on the ground, and one of their stores was empty, and the baby bear was ransacking the remaining storehouses for more food as he looked at them, not knowing what he was doing wrong. Sejin is devastated, but the rabbits are furious, and the black rabbit even takes out his hammer to beat the baby bear while the others scold him verbally. Sejin checks the remaining storehouses and finds that one-third of their sweet potatoes and carrots had been eaten or otherwise damaged, and the bear did not touch the cherry tomatoes at all. The bear then runs to Sejin after being scolded by the rabbits, and he starts crying. As Sejin picks him up, he realizes that the baby bear had grown twice in size overnight, and was now much larger and heavier than before. He realizes that he forgot that plants and animals grow at a different rate inside the tower, and now he is no longer surprised by the fact. But then he remembers the manager's warning that the baby bear would eat all the food in the cave, and now he realizes that he should have listened to him. The manager sends Sejin another message, saying that the baby crimson bears are the biggest gluttons in the tower, and can eat up to 100 kilos of food every day if it is available. Sejin is relieved to get the support of the expert again and apologizes for doubting him. The tower manager replies that he does not mind it since he has apologized now, and Sejin replies that he thought the manager was just jealous because of him feeding the bear cub. The tower manager replies that what was important right now was to send the baby crimson bear away, and even though he agrees, Sejin wonders how he can do that. Ultimately, he takes the help of his friends and an onion leaf rope, which he ties around the baby bear like a harness. After that is done, he asks the team outside the cave if they are ready, and they are also prepared to get the bear cub out. They pull him up using the rope, whose other end is tied to a tree outside, and all the rabbits except the mother rabbit, and all the worker bees use their full strength as Sejin cheers them on. But the bear cub starts to flail as he does not want to go, and as he starts crying, Sejin offers him some honey to calm him down. He tells the baby bear that he should go back to his mom now, and the honey pacifies the bear enough to not resist being pulled up. He wishes Sejin goodbye happily, and then the quest to send him out is completed, and the tower manager gives the reward in the form of a skill called Seed Gathering Level 1, which slightly increases the chance of obtaining better seeds from harvesting crops. The bear cub was dropped home by the rabbits, and as they return to the cave, all of them are tired. Sejin commends them for their hard work. But then everyone feels hungry at the same time, and seeing their supplies thrashed, he asks them if they should eat cherry tomatoes today. A few days later, on an otherwise ordinary day, Sejun and his rabbit friends are intimidated by a giant bear that casts its shadow inside the cave. Everyone is shocked and afraid as they look upward with open mouths at their friend, the baby bear, and his mom, the giant crimson bear, who did not seem to be here to harm them. And on realizing that the baby bear invited his mom to the cave, Sejin panics and fears what is going to happen next. And as he thinks that she might be here to eat him, he panics. He is sweating profusely as he imagines the mama bear angrily picking him up and saying, How dare he kidnap her child for one full day? She won't forgive him and eat him while he is helpless against her. Sejin wonders if he really will die here without seeing the faces of his family one last time. He gets down on his knees as he begs the mother bear to let him go since he is not tasty because the only thing he eats is tomatoes. She is confused, and then the tower manager relays her message to Sejun, saying that she does not plan to harm or threaten him. Sejun is shocked and asks the manager if she understood what the bear was saying, and after affirming, the manager gives him the reason why the bears were here. The mama bear wants him to give her honey to feed her cub. Sejin is a bit confused and takes some time to process that the bear mom is not here for herself but for her kid, and as she growls loudly, 
the black rabbit shuts his ears. The manager says that the mother bear was saying she was going to protect the surrounding area in return for honey, and then she stretches her palm to the floor of the cave. Now Sejin is relieved, and his rabbit friends are also happy, and he tells the giant crimson bear that he will give her honey. The tower manager tells him to get on the mama bear's paw, and he obeys. Then the giant bear slowly takes him up and outside the cave, and as Sejin looks back at his farms inside the cave, he gets nostalgic. He thanks his crops that have been growing well inside the cave all this time and have been sustaining him. The reason he is so sentimental is because he thinks he is finally getting out of the place to see the tower, and he is excited to see the true world that was outside his little cave. As he comes out, he is momentarily stunned by the bright light, but as he gets used to it, he sees an amazing sight. He exclaims as he sees the expanse of the tower, with a giant glowing tower in the center and a vast mountain range stretching from it to his place. He was so far away from the central tower that it appeared as if the mountains were quite tiny, and from this distance, they looked mostly barren to him. Sejun is still dazed by the magnificent scene, and he asks if this vast area is really inside the tower. But then his attention goes to the central tower and the glowing beam coming out of it that pointed straight to the sky and he wonders what it was. The tower manager tells him that it was a waypoint, and Sejun is shocked to hear that. A waypoint was the only device that allowed hunters to move between the floors of the tower. It was in the form of a giant magic crystal placed inside a stone configuration. Sejun finally sees a ray of hope to get out of the tower using the waypoint, as he would first get to the first floor and then exit the tower to go into the real world. He is overjoyed, but then reality hits that going there will not be easy. As he is thinking about whether he should cross the wilderness to reach there, the baby crimson bear is asking his mom to let his friend down. She puts him down, and Sejun thanks her as the baby bear runs to him and hugs him. He is still thinking about the waypoint and realizes that, with a normal human walking speed, it is impossible to cover that distance. So as he holds the bear cub, he asks its mom if she could take him to the beam by any chance. The mama bear says something, and the tower manager interprets it as her refusal. Sejin wants to know why, and the manager tells him that the waypoint or the area before that was not her territory. If Sejin wants to get to the waypoint, he will have to defeat about 3,000 monsters to get there. Now that he knows that there are monsters on his way to the device, he realizes it would not be easy getting there, even with help. Then the mama bear points to the forest on the other side of the cave, and the tower manager interprets it as her saying that her territory is from inside the forest to the surrounding cave. Most monsters from inside the forest don't come here because this place leads to the wilderness, and the mother bear says that it might be hard for her to protect Sejun if he leaves her territory. Sejun realizes this and is a little disheartened when his rabbit friends and Queen Poison Honeybee come out of the cave. The black rabbit has brought his backpack, and Sejun thanks him as the queen bee reaches his shoulder. The baby bear hugs the black rabbit, who is initially startled, but then he pats its head happily. The mama bear is saying something to Sejun, and as she exhales loudly, he feels a strong gust of warm wind, and the queen honeybee hides behind him. On the ground, the bear cub is licking his friend. Sejun understands what she means this time, and he takes out the bottle of honey from his bag. He tells the bear cub that it is time to eat honey, and he immediately turns to Sejun after covering the black rabbit's face and drool. Sejun gives him the honey as his eyes sparkle with excitement, and he starts to eat it with everyone watching. Sejin then asks the mama bear if she also wants to have some more honey, and the queen bee is even more timid now. The tower manager relays the mother bear's message that she is fine and wants the farmer to give the honey only to her cub. She says that there was nothing to eat in this place, and that is why her cub has not been growing well. But he grew up a lot in the one day he was in the cave, and as Sejin thinks about that day, he is upset along with the bee. He thinks that the bear cub grew a lot because it ate a lot and almost finished their stored crops for good. Then the mama bear says that the honey was really sweet smelling, so it will help a lot, and now the queen bee is shy on receiving the compliments. Then Sejin asks the mother bear if there was nothing to eat in the forest, did she starve herself today? He had heard from the tower manager that giant crimson bears eat a lot, and if the kid could not have much food, she would also not have much. The mother bear replies that she has been starving for three days to find this cave, and Sejin is shocked. He says that three days is a lot, and even though her baby was more important to her, moms shouldn't act this way. He says that this will not do and asks her to wait for a moment as he gives the black hunter rabbit an urgent order. The rabbit is also excited, but not as excited as Sejun, who plans to show the mama bear his skills as a chef. Inside the cave, the black rabbit hunts down fish, while the sickle rabbit chops carrots into small parts so that Sejun can use them in his cooking. 
he cooks the carrots, onions, tomatoes, and fish in a delicious stew, and as he tastes it, he says that it is complete and perfect. He has not only prepared a lot of stew for the mother bear, but also roasted skewers of fish and onions, whole roasted fish, and vegetables too. The giant crimson bear is a bit confused about it, but her cub is already drooling, and as Sejun explains that the stew was a bit basic in ingredients, it was full of taste and nutrition, and the baby bear has already started eating. Sejin tells the mother bear that she should also eat well so that her baby grows up healthy and well protected. And now she is also drooling. She is emotional and suddenly puts her paws around Sejin and the two rabbits that just helped him, and then hugs them. The bear hug is really too much for them to bear, and Sejin and the rabbits cry out in pain. The tower manager is also watching this from the office and relaying the message of the mother bear thanking the tower farmer to Sejin, who cannot breathe. The manager sighs, saying that she had been watching over the bear family ever since the bear cub left the cave a few days ago because she was worried that the baby bear would call its mom to attack the cave. The manager does not know why, but the crimson giant bear wants to establish friendly relations with humans, and since she thought it was a good thing, she stepped up and told the mother bear that she would act as an interpreter. She did not expect the situation to turn out like this either. The tower manager is glad that now she will have more to eat if Sejin comes out of the cave and increases his field. She thinks that if the giant crimson bear becomes his bodyguard, she will have one less thing to worry about, and it would be like killing two birds with one stone. And then she praises herself, saying that this was to be expected of the genius black dragon alien Fratani, and laughs happily. Meanwhile, on the middle floors of the tower, in the wandering merchant inspector bureau, the fox inspector Zerath is reading a report on Theo. The information is missing, especially because Theo was a beginner wandering merchant, and his rights were protected by the tower. So the only thing Zerath knows is that he is from Graner Village and trades mostly with humans on the lower floors, and his sources have not been confirmed yet. The same goes with Scaram, who also did not seem to be a skilled merchant, but he was still steadily making money without disclosing his supply channel. Now Zerath is confused about how Scaram and Theo earned so much money, and he finds it suspicious. Then suddenly, a poodle assistant enters the office to present a report about the burglary incident at the Great Landlord Grid's warehouse on the 55th floor. The stolen goods were recently making their way back to the black market in small batches, and she was here to deliver the report of the stolen items that the director had asked her to make. Zerath is not impressed that he has to solve a case involving Landlord Grid who was notorious for being vicious and overcharging the peasants. He complains that their inspection bureau has to step in to solve cases for people with such nasty personalities, and he wants the director to be less chummy with such people. But then another of Zerath's subordinates comes to report that they got information from one of their agents managing the passageway that a wandering merchant by the name of Theo had just arrived on the 75th floor. Zerath was waiting for this and gets up, leaving the current report on hiatus until the matter with the cat merchant was solved. He puts on his hood, determined to find out the truth behind the wandering cat merchant while putting his honor as an inspector online. Meanwhile, unaware of the troubles coming for him, Theo is just busy eating some snacks in the market. Three days have passed since Sejun made the deal with the mother bear to protect him and his farm in exchange for feeding her cub. She visits Sejun in the morning with her baby, and they happily greet him while he welcomes them too. He then asks the mother bear to bring him outside the cave, and as she brings him outside, he gives him a big food package to eat while she is outside on patrol duty. The bear is grateful and leaves to patrol the area while leaving her baby, who was as big as Sejun now, in his care. This was her daily routine. And thanks to the protection she provided, Sejun was beginning to expand his business. He and the rabbit started moving their things outside the cave little by little and started clearing the area around the cave. But the situation was completely different here, as the soil was not as fertile as the underground soil, and it was also full of rocks and pebbles. As Sejun and the shovel rabbit examine it, both are worried about the soil, which is too dry and full of stones, which would make growing the crops here too difficult. But then they hear the roar of the baby crimson bear and see him recklessly digging around the ground as if he were swimming in it. He is having fun while playing in the mud, and the black warrior rabbit and cart rabbit are picking up the stones from the dugout ground. Sejun is excited to see them working so hard and especially praises the bear cub, saying that picking stones will be easier now. As a reward for his action, he treats him to a roasted sweet potato, which the bear gladly eats. Sejin says that in just a few days, the bear cub had grown almost as tall as him, and he is scared just thinking about what may have happened if he stayed inside the cave and ended all their food. 
then Sejin starts planting the sweet potato crop because planting root crops in barren soil may provide a better result than other crops. His sowing skill is in progress and boosts the chance of the sweet potato taking root, and his skill proficiency and XP both keep on rising gradually. The shovel rabbit is also helping him out, and Sejin says that they will try for cherry tomatoes later. But then he is in for a shock as he turns back and finds the bear cub digging around the area, and eating the sweet potatoes they had just planted. He looks really proud but is shocked when Sejin scolds him, saying that they are not digging the ground for treasure hunting. Their hard work has been neutralized by the bear, who is depressed as Sejin says they will have to replant the whole field. As the shovel rabbit lectures the crimson bear, Sejin thinks he needs to teach the cub the concept of planting because he is going to stay here. Meanwhile, Theo is back on the 38th floor of the tower ready for another batch of sales. This time, he declares that the sales will take place in batches of 300 magical cherry tomatoes, and he has 18 of them in total. The hunters are excited for the auction. And after it ends, Theo finds that the gold was much less than the last time because the rich pushover was not here today. As he thinks it would be nice if more people like him came, Kim Dongshik approaches the cat and asks him if he has checked that the contract from the last time is fulfilled. Theo welcomes the veteran hunter, who wants the cat merchant to relay the message to Sejun that King Dongshik of the Phoenix Guild has talked to his family so that they don't worry. Theo says that he got it, but then asks him why he did not take part in the cherry tomato auction this time. Dongshik tells him that this time he needs something other than the cherry tomatoes and asks him if they can take a picture because his daughter likes cats. Theo agrees in exchange for a reward, and the hunter gives him a pouch of red pepper powder that was indispensable to Koreans. The cat merchant is curious about how this spice tastes, and he makes the mistake of following his curiosity before Dongshik can warn him. He screams in pain as he jumps while saying that his tongue is on fire. Later, Theo goes to the market city and upgrades the load-carrying capacity of his bundle. He is still reeling from the damage he took from the red pepper powder earlier, and his face is still swollen. But he is happy that now that the capacity of his bag has been increased, he can fit much more cherry tomatoes inside it. And that way, he can increase his profit. He thinks that it is worth it to invest all the incentives he got from Sejin to upgrade his bundle. Theo laughs to himself, saying that at this rate, he will soon gather 1,000 tower coins and become a mid-class merchant. And soon after that, he hopes to become chairman and make Sejin kneel before him. Theo decides that now he should stop by the hardware store and finish Sejin's errand when he is enticed by the smell of roasted skewers coming from a roadside stall. Theo goes to the stall, hoping to soothe his mouth with it, and follows Sejin's teachings to procure a discount from the shopkeeper. As he laughs about it while eating the roasted fish, someone stops him. It is Zaraf, who is in the disguise of the merchant of the last time and Theo recognizes her as the pushover from the last time who almost got tricked by Scaram. Zarath is furious upon being called a pushover by the cat who ruined her operation, but she has to keep calm as she introduces himself. Theo asks him what the matter was, and Zarath says that she never got to thank him for saving him back then, so she wants to treat him to a meal. Theo rejects the offer, saying that he is busy right now, shocking Zarath, who tries her best to get him to come with her. She asks him not to be so cold and says they can just have tea if he does not have much time. But the cat merchant says that he cannot drink hot things. Zarath changes the bait and says that one of her friends works at a really popular dessert shop where people have to wait a few years for reservations, and they can have a very special dessert there for free. Theo is getting annoyed by her persistence and says that he does not even like sweet things. Zarath is irritated by his firmness, and she has no choice but to kneel down before him and ask him to listen to her. Theo is flustered and asks her why she was throwing such a tantrum, and Zarath puts on an act, saying that she became a wandering merchant only recently, and that is why she is lacking in the skills of a merchant. She says she was very impressed when Theo saw through the clever ploy of the evil Scaram at once and saved a complete stranger like her out of his consideration. Zarath then loudly says that she respects Theo and wants to learn his merchant skills, calling him the amazing and cool great wandering merchant cat, Sir Theo. Theo is overjoyed to hear so many adjectives before his name, and he smugly says that since she was so insistent, he can teach her a bit. As Zara thanks him, she grins because her ultimate technique worked again. Her unheeded begging technique had never failed her, and now Theo finds it embarrassing and awkward that she was on her knees in the market. Everyone is staring at them, and Zarath gets up nervously, and then asks Theo where he was going. He tells her that he was about to buy something from the smithy alley, and now Zarath is curious. She wants to see what kind of excellent stuff the cat merchant is going to buy and follows him silently until he comes to a shop, 
which he thinks should be good. Zerath is surprised to see him enter a shop that had a 50% discount on everything, and as they enter it, she notices that it was a bit shabby and had a lot of old items. The shop contained only unappraised items, and that made them unfit to be sold. In short, this store was a junk store, and she wonders what kind of merchant skills Theo is going to teach her here. As the cat asks the shopkeeper if the board outside was true and they really sold all items for 20 tower coins, Zerath recalls the shops they had been to on their way here. She had asked Theo if he was looking for items that could be resold, but he just smugly laughed and told her that she would find it out when she saw them. They passed through a lot of stores, and Zerath found a pretty dagger in one of them, and she told Theo that there were many high-class items in the smithy she just visited. But Theo confidently told her that he doesn't buy those trifling items. And now he was in a junk store, where the owner clearly told him that most of the items in their shop were unappraised, so they could never know their true value. He adds that if he pays for items that are old and rotten because of their age, they will forge them too, and tells him to choose whatever he likes. Then suddenly, Theo slams his paws on the table and loudly asks the shopkeeper to give him a discount. Zerath is stunned for a moment, followed by loud internal screaming as she realizes that the merchant skill of her target was something so stupid. As Theo demands the shopkeeper give him a discount, Zerath is completely baffled. The junk shop already sold everything at a high discount, and he was asking for more. And on top of that, he was confident that he would get it. The shopkeeper tells him that he could take the items for 18 tower coins instead of the regular 20, and Zerath is speechless because Theo's tactic worked. But he is not satisfied with that and demands more discounts, and now the fox can't believe it anymore. The shopkeeper is impressed at the cat merchant's boldness and tells him that he cannot go lower than 15 tower coins. But Theo demands that he take only 13 tower coins. He promises to come here very often if he gives him this discount, and the shopkeeper laughs at how determined he was. He says that it has been a long time since he met someone so amusing and agrees to sell the wares for only 13 tower coins. As Theo celebrates, Zerath cannot understand what just happened, and then he turns to ask her if she just saw what he did. She tells him what he wants to hear and calls him cool, and as she claps for him, she knows that he was just being stubborn. Then Zerath asks Theo what he was planning to buy here in the first place, and he takes a look around as he tells her that he will decide it soon. It does not take him long to find what he is looking for in an old wooden box, and he shows off a straw hat to Zerath, saying he was planning to buy this. She cannot believe it and asks Theo if he was serious about buying that thing, and he replies that he was serious but asks why she was reacting like that. Zerath asks him if he cannot see what was wrong with his choice because he did not even select a weapon but a worn-out straw hat that definitely had to be junk. The shopkeeper hears her words and asks her if she has any complaints about his shop, and she is taken aback as she says there is nothing like that. Even Theo scolds her for being a nuisance, and she apologizes while being upset and confused about why she was apologizing. But Theo has decided to buy the straw hat, as Sejin had told him to buy whatever she liked, and he liked the hat at first glance. Then they leave the shop, and he tells Zerath that since he has shown her everything, he will be going back now. She is confused, and Theo gently pats her shoulder while acting smug and tells her that his merchant techniques must have passed on to her nicely. He tells Zerath that he hopes that she becomes a good merchant, and with those parting words, he takes off. She is stupefied for a moment, but then thinks that she can't help it. She thinks that, despite her doubts, it would be unnatural to follow the cat merchant any more than this and decides to retreat for now. But as she turns to go back, something clicks within Zerath's mind. She turns back in shock, takes a good look at the straw hat with Theo, and suddenly remembers that it was on the list of stolen items from some landlord. She is shocked and wonders if it was really the same hat, and she tries to convince herself that the probability is very low. Back in the cave on the 99th floor, Sejun is extracting seeds from the carrot plants that he grew. The carrot plants had flowered earlier than he expected, and they had produced nice seeds. He thinks that he will plant half of them in the cave and the other half on the land. Recently, the carrots in their storage have been quickly getting less because of the baby bear, and now the rabbits have started to become impatient, so planting more carrots would be a good idea. Then suddenly the cart rabbit and black warrior rabbit called out Sejin because they had caught fish, and it was breakfast time. He thinks for a while about the menu, decides to go with fish soup, and asks the black rabbit and the sickle rabbit to clean the fish. Sejin wants to make a soup especially for the mother rabbit who is pregnant and has very little appetite these days, and he goes to get some fresh cherry tomatoes to use. He harvests a bunch of them using his name Dagger, and that gives him the usual amount of job XP and the harvest skill proficiency. 
but now that the proficiency of his skill harvest has finally increased to its limit, it goes up from level 3 to level 4, and Sejun learns that new effects have been added to his skill now. Sejun is curious about it and reads the information window of his skill, along with the usual ability to make slightly overripe or underripe fruits optimal for harvesting. He has the bonus ability to increase the level of his harvested crops by one level. Although the system mentions a very low probability of this happening and it sounds ambiguous, Sejun is pleased that he can occasionally have higher level crops. He is happy just thinking about being able to eat even tastier cherry tomatoes. But then he wonders if there are additional effects to skills when they reach level 4, or was it just with the harvest skill? And he realizes that he can only find that out by leveling up his other skills in the same way. Then the father rabbit calls him, telling him to work quickly. Then the father rabbit calls him, telling him to work quickly. And Sejun realizes this is not the time to get distracted. He prepares the food, garnishes it with some fine carrot leaves, and presents the clear fish soup to the pregnant mother rabbit. He is pleased with his creation, and the information window for the fish soup is displayed. It was a clear soup that was filled with Sejun's love and consideration for the mother rabbit, and was made by cooking fish, carrots, and green onions for a long time. Sejin tells the mother rabbit that she must eat well even if she has no appetite because it is important that she take good care of her health when she is pregnant and expecting babies soon. The father rabbit is a bit embarrassed, and Sejin tells him that the rest of them were handling the farming activities pretty well on their own, so he should not worry about other things and focus only on his wife. As the father rabbit starts feeding his wife, Sejin tells the black rabbit that they will see his little siblings soon and he is also very excited for that. Then the bear cub calls Sejin from outside the roof, and he replies that he was here just in time. Sejin puts on his backpack and carries a big basket made of green onion leaves, and tells his rabbit friends that they should go out and eat. He leaves the crops inside the cave for the cart rabbit and sickle rabbit to handle, and takes the rest along with him. He first ties the basket to a rope and then ties it around his waist firmly. Once he has confirmed that it is nicely tied, he signals to the baby bear to start pulling him up and he uses a giant rock as a pulley and pulls Sejin out. The work is not much for the baby bear, and as Sejin goes up, he tells his rabbit friends that he will meet them outside. A few days ago, he had arrived at an easy method to come out of the cave using a giant rock as a pulley to build a manual elevator. Sejin greets the baby bear and then thinks about how they have been starting their day with him coming to their cave every morning to start his work and eat his breakfast. But then he looks at the giant rock and is amazed by what it signifies. A few days ago, he just asked the mother bear to bring him a big and firm rock to tie a rope to, and she bought something that was big even for her size. Sejin still cannot help but be surprised by it, and he thinks that the scale was different here on the 99th floor. But thanks to that, he was able to climb out of the cave comfortably. Then Sejin pats the baby bear, who has grown quite big to be called a baby, and he says that he did a good job this time, and it appeared he was growing bigger and stronger every day. The bear is also happy, and Sejin says that seeing how quickly he pulled him out earlier, he must really have wanted to see him quickly. But as the bear starts sniffing and scratching the breakfast basket, Sejin realizes that he just wants to have his breakfast quickly. He gives the bear what he wants and shows that he has brought a bunch of roasted sweet potatoes for him. He says that the bear has always eaten them raw, so he wants him to try the roasted ones too. Sejin had left some of the sweet potatoes he cooked last night, and the manager sulked about that too. But the bear is not even listening to him as the taste of the sweet potatoes blows him away completely. He is amazed and starts eating them quickly, including the onion leaf cover outside them. Sejin tells him to slow down, but by then, only one sweet potato is left. The baby bear has an idea and he runs with the sweet potato in his mouth and then begins digging around. Sejin asks him what he was doing, and the bear proudly points towards the roasted sweet potato he has just planted in the soil. As he covers it with soil and pats it, Sejin asks him if he was planning to eat the sweet potato after it grows, and the bear proudly says that it was correct because he has finally learned the concept of farming. But then Sejin and the rabbit start laughing and rolling on the floor, and the bear is shocked. They can't control themselves, and Sejin calls him cute as he gets up and explains what the bear was doing wrong. He tells him that the sweet potato won't grow just because it was planted in the soil because the concept of farming does not work with cooked food. The bear is stunned and aghast, and Sejin tells him that if he liked it so much, he will make it again for him. But then he wipes out the tears that came out while laughing and says that he had the best laugh in a long time thanks to him. But it seems that the baby bear's antics are not over yet, and as Sejin hears a squishing sound, he turns around and is horrified to see fish planted in the soil. 
the bear cub had planted the fish brought for his breakfast in the ground, and Sejun and his rabbit friends are shocked and speechless. He says that they will have to give the bear some more classes about farming, and the rabbits seem to agree, as opposed to the bear, who is hungry because he just put all his food into the ground. But just beneath them, on the roof of the cave, something is happening inside the honeybee comb that has become a full-fledged inverted castle. The queen poisonous honeybee is sitting all alone in her room, and she looks gloomy and uncertain as she looks at a special egg in her hands. The next day, outside the cave, the baby crimson bear stands on its hind paws menacingly as it gears to face the black warrior rabbit, who has his wooden hammer drawn out. The rabbit is serious as he goes ahead to deal a strike on the bear cub, but the bear is not serious at all and takes it more like a game than training. He rushes towards the black warrior rabbit, who jumps up to dodge his charge and then quickly lands three strikes on the bear's back in the time it takes for him to stand up. The rabbit was satisfied with the result and let its guard down for a second, during which the bear cub attacked him with his paw. But all he did was catch the black warrior rabbit and hug him while licking him. They both laugh, and the black rabbit tries to free himself from his big friend's grip. They get back to their play fighting again, and Sejun looks at them while relaxing and wonders if they are actually training or just fooling around. The chubby cart rabbit comes to him with tomato and honey juice in the carrot cups, and Sejun picks up a cup, thanking the cart rabbit as he was just feeling thirsty. The rabbit returns his greetings, and as Sejun takes the first sip, he notices the poisoned honeybees coming out of their nest. He thinks that the bees are going out on their daily patrol, and as he tells them to take care, he is surprised when he notices the queen honeybee also coming out. She looks very serious as she carries a small, round object wrapped in onion leaves and flies straight towards Sejun. He expresses his confusion upon seeing the queen bee out and asks her what she was doing outside her hive as she was busy spawning. The bee says something and then gently and gracefully places the small round object in Sejun's palms, and he asks what it was. The queen bee shakes her head as she starts flying away, and so do the other bees with her. The queen bee flies away back to the cave without looking back, and as she enters the cave, Sejun decides to check what the thing is that he was just given. He begins to unpeel the round object and is surprised by what he finds inside. There was a poison honey bee cocoon, and it was not just an ordinary cocoon but that of the poison bee queen. The caterpillar had accidentally ingested royal jelly, and when it became a cocoon, it was destined to evolve into a queen bee and not just an ordinary worker bee. There were ten days left for the cocoon to hatch, and the queen bee that would emerge from it would recognize the first target it saw as its owner. Sejun is still in awe as he realizes what he is holding in his hand. He realizes that it has not been long since the bee he knew became the queen, and that is why the power of her hive is not strong. His two rabbit friends are also intently listening to him talk about the details. Sejun knows that if a new queen is born into a beehive that is not yet ready to split, it will mean that the already weak strength of the hive will be halved and he realizes that the queen bee gave him the cocoon for that reason only. Sejun thinks that this must be a precious child to the queen bee, and he gets up suddenly, making the rabbit on his shoulder fall to the ground. Sejun exclaims in joy, thinking that this was a brilliant opportunity for him. He decides to work hard so that the cocoon can hatch into a wonderful queen poison honey bee, and he cheers up the future queen inside the cocoon. He tells the bee that he is looking forward to the day they meet for the first time. On the other hand, Theo has just returned from his sales trip on the lower floors to the 99th floor. As he laughs and sings on his way back to the cave through the forest, he celebrates that he is almost back and that it is almost time for him to be rewarded. Theo is happy and lost in dreams as he says that now Sejun will kneel down before him and he will enjoy the authority of the CEO. But those happy dreams of the cat merchant are interrupted when he sees the crimson bear cub outside the cave. He is shocked when he realizes that it was the fearsome giant crimson bear and snaps out at the baby, asking him who he was and what he was doing in front of the cave. The confused baby bear turns around to look at who was shouting, and it has Sejun's bag in his mouth, and seeing that gives Theo the biggest shock. He screams that it was Sejun's bag and wonders what it was doing outside the cave, as the confused bear still has no idea. Then Theo suddenly becomes horrified as he asks the bear cub if he killed Sejun. He loses all hope, falls to his knees, damning it all, and curses himself. He says that his ominous thoughts always proved to be true, and he would have liked them to be wrong this time. But then Theo's expressions change from grief to rage, and he says that he should have seen this coming as he felt something was off ever since going into the 38th floor. As he takes out his claws, the cat merchant says that he felt like running as soon as possible, and now he knows why. 
but then he screams at the bear that he has still not used up all his time as the sail scat yet, with tears in his eyes. Blinded by his rage, Theo jumps at the bear cub so that he can claim revenge for losing the privilege of sitting on Sejun's lap, and the bear cub is shocked by what is happening. But as Theo is just about to reach the bear cub, Sejun starts coming out of the cave, and he is pleasantly surprised to see his sails cat. Theo is also greatly surprised, and he makes a soft landing after ignoring the baby bear, then darts towards Sejun, jumping over his face as he was trying to get out of the cave, and he barely holds on to the rope somehow. The cat merchant is in full panic mode as he examines the human's face, asking him if he was alright or if the bear cub had taken a bite out of him. Sejin is confused and asks Theo what was wrong, but the cat merchant has already moved down to his legs and is examining his knees now. He asks Sejin if his knees were fine, and then asks him how he was getting out of the cave, and Sejin tells him to stop moving because he could fall at this rate. But Theo is not yet done with his questions, and he asks Sejin what the deal was with the giant crimson bear cub. Sejin has had enough of the cat's questions, and he tells him to ask them one by one. Then he comes out of the cave and explains everything to his sales cat. He introduces the crimson bear cub to the cat merchant and says that their relationship began when the bear cub fell into the cave, and they became friends quickly. Now, he has made a deal with the bear's mom, where she protects the surrounding areas for him, and in return, he gives the cub food and honey. Theo still finds it hard to believe, and even his rabbit friends tell him that Sejin was telling the truth. But now the cat merchant is a bit relieved after hearing the full story, and he tells Sejin that he fears that he was eaten by the giant crimson bear. Sejin also finds his doubts understandable because even the cub was big enough to kill and eat a human. But then he suddenly realizes that it was too ambiguous to call the baby bear simply a cub all the time, and he wants to give him a name for convenience's sake. Sejin takes Theo's help to ask the bear cub for its name, and when the cat talks with the bear, he translates its answer for the human, saying that the bear cub says that it was just a bear cub and did not know anything about a name. Sejun thinks in that case he can give the bear cub a temporary name, and he has something very good in his mind. The bear cub is really excited to get his new name, and as he eagerly waits, Theo asks Sejun what he was thinking to name it. He laughs smugly as he says that he has an amazing name in mind and then proceeds to name the bear cub Kyun. Sejun is really happy to declare that name because it was based on what the baby bear cries out every time, and he feels that it was the perfect name to give it to him. Only Sejun thinks that, because while the bear cub is still confused, neither Theo nor the two rabbits find it good, and the fat cart rabbit's face says that it is a terrible name. Theo comes up front and shows a thumbs down to Sejun, saying that he has no sense in naming people, and he is shocked. He begins to coddle the baby bear, asking if he does not like his new name. He gives him chin rubs and head pats as he calls him by his new name, Kyuin, and asks him what he thinks. But before the bear cub has any chance to reply, Sejin begins to tickle him until he is rolling on the floor laughing and has nothing to say. The rabbits and Theo realize that this was Sejin's trick to convince the bear cub into accepting his new name, and it seems that he worked. But Theo is frustrated by all the attention Kyuin is receiving, and he climbs on Sejin's head as he tells him to stop tickling the bear cub and look at what he has. He opens his bundle and hands him the pouch of tower coins, saying that he completed all the missions this time too, and sold everything as well. Sejin is pleased to learn that, and then Theo asks him how much time he would get to be the sale scat for these results. Sejin compliments the cat merchant, telling him that he did a great job. As for his duration as the sale scat, he says that combining the leftover time from before, he has around 38 hours to be in his favorite post. As the rabbits start climbing on their bear friend, Theo celebrates that he has a lot of time to enjoy the luxuries of being a sail scat. He tells Sejin that he is going to use them all up now, and asks him to give him the churu. Sejin gladly holds the cat in his lap and starts feeding him the churu with his hand. Theo is pleased and says that he really did a great job this time. He is fully enjoying his favorite snacks while in Sejin's lap. But then suddenly, the baby bear pushes him to the side and licks the churu instead. Theo realizes this and gives a condescending look to the bear cub before asking what it was thinking it was doing, and Kewing has no idea. The cat attacks him out of nowhere and then begins shouting at him, saying how dare he put his tongue on his churu and how dare he step into Sejin's lap when he was there. He is furious and tells the bear cub he will never forgive him, ready to attack him again. But Sejin somehow holds him back in position. But Kewing is hurt and is sobbing about the pain, and then suddenly, he cries so loudly that everyone near him is stunned. The forest starts shaking moments after it, and as Sejin realizes what is going to happen, he is terrified. 
but there is not much time for him to do that, as suddenly the mother bear jumps out of the forest with great speed and power, and Sejun and Theo can only stare at her with their mouths gaping as she prepares to land right next to them. The mama bear lands in front of them, and the shockwave from that knocks Sejun off his feet. The mother bear looks menacing and furious as she takes her baby under her cover, looking at the reason he was crying. And in front of her are Theo, Sejun, and the rabbits, and as Kewing tells his scary mom about what just happened, she stares down at Theo. Now the cat merchant has his tail between his legs, and he is terrified out of his wits, while Sejun also realizes that this situation is as bad as it can get. With this, the video ends. Theo is in for a rough time. And even though nothing had happened to Sejun, it seems the cat's ominous sense was right after all. What will the mother bear do to the cat who made her baby cry, and who will mediate to stop the fight? Also, what will happen when the cocoon of the queen honeybee hatches and the new queen comes out of it? Let us find out the answers to these questions in the next video. So if you enjoyed this video, leave a like and a comment, and also subscribe to our channel for more videos like this.